Okay, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Ask the King, my bi-monthly Q&A show, where I go through your questions and pick the best ones for me to answer here live on stream and also on demand on YouTube. Uh, you can submit your questions, FYI, if you're not aware, through various means. First of all, my forums, thekingofhate.com. That's where you can post up your questions starting right now for the next episode of Ask the King, which is actually going to take place a special holiday episode on December 21st, 2017. It's actually the first time ever that I'm doing a holiday-themed Ask the King show. <clears throat> so I certainly hope that you will uh, tune in for that one if you can, all right? So the thread's already open on the forums. You can post your questions up there. Or the day of, when I'm actually reviewing the forum questions, I also allow people to post up on my Twitter and I picked a few questions from Twitter for this episode. And right here, folks, my Patreon. If you pledge to my Patreon, uh, there is a perk level, meaning if you pl pledge uh, a certain amount, you will be able to get your question answered for sure here on the show. And in fact, a significant amount of questions that I'll be going through today on Ask the King will be from patrons. So that really, honestly, if you absolutely want to get your, your question answered live on the show, that's the best way to do it, Okay. Um, so it's October 26, 2017, folks, <clears throat> and we are in the midst of an incredibly, incredibly busy hardcore gaming season this year. It's just nuts how crazy busy gaming has been this year. So many good releases already. I mean, just the past few weeks, games like Shadow of War, Assassin's Creed Origins, and South Park, The Fractured But Whole have been absolutely outstanding releases. And then, of course, every once in a while, you get a stinker which you know is going to happen, and sadly this year it's WWE 2K18. Playing through my career mode was absolute atrocity, how bad that fucking game was this year. So, you know, you get hits or misses, but at least we've had a lot of hits, right? And everything's been going, going good. My streams, people have been coming out every day to check out my gameplay streams. In fact, tonight I'm doing a midnight release, which is really 9 p.m. for me because it's specific time, release of Wolfenstein 2. I'm going to be playing Assassin's Creed Origins and Super Mario Odyssey uh, shortly. So it's going to be nuts. It's been so busy for me. It's a rarity that I actually take the time to do Ask the King during this gaming season. But I said, you know what? What the hell? I'm going to do it because it is the time. It's been two months. Uh, you've got plenty of questions saved up for the show. And uh, I'm pretty excited. I am. I'm pretty excited for uh, your questions. So let's get to it. Okay, folks? So we're going to start with patron questions. We've got quite a lot of these. So bear with me, folks. We've got to get through a lot of questions from the patrons this time around. First question from Timic83. He says, do you think there will ever be a video game crash similar to the E.T. crash due to the oversaturation of the market? If you don't know what Timic is referencing, back in the 1980s, there was a big home console video game boom. All right. And what happened during this time period is Atari, the, what was it? The Odyssey, the, um, what was the third one? There was like three or four major home consoles that exploded. Arcades, video arcades started opening up throughout the country of the United States. Video games became a huge part of pop culture during the 1980s. And then what ended up happening was that there was so much going on, oversaturation with these video games and too many consoles and too much competition that there was a big video game crash. In particular, the biggest, um, the biggest case of this was a video game called E.T., the Extraterrestrial. You guys might remember a movie called E.T., right? From Steven Spielberg. Well, this was the video game tie-in for all the home consoles, okay? In particular, it was actually the Atari that was the, it was the mass produced for the Atari. I'm not even exaggerating. They made hundreds of... I, I, I don't know if the answer is actually hundreds of thousands or millions. They made a ridiculous amount of copies of E.T., thinking this game would be the biggest selling game ever since the movie was so popular, all right? The game was a piece of donkey shit. It was a little, you know, not even 8-bit at this point. Just a little pixelated E.T. walking around going blip, 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 blip. And it would you have to eat Reese's Pieces that were just a single pixel on the screen. You would constantly fall in holes. You had to hold a trigger button to get your E.T. to levitate out of these holes. It was basically a really bad game. Some of the worst sound effects I've ever heard in a video game. If you actually play this game with the sound on, it could actually hurt your ears. And I don't know what made them think that this was, like, a good, a good game at all. All right? Um... One of the, by far one of the worst games ever made. I owned it. I actually owned it for the Atari 2600. I had a 7800, which was the higher model. See what I mean? We, today we have, oh, we have the Xbox, the Xbox One S, and the Xbox One X, and the PS4 Pro, right? They did that back then, too. There was an Atari 2600, um, a middle one that was like 5400, and they had a 7800. They did the same thing back then. So basically, here we are. 
you know, some 30 years later and we were doing exactly the same shit that happened back then. Seriously. But anyway, I digress. Uh, they made so many copies of this game and it didn't sell. No one wanted this game because the game was a piece of garbage and it basically the entire industry crashed. Like they had all these games were being mass produced and no one was buying them. And a lot of these companies ended up either going out of business or basically lost a ton of money because the industry grew so big, there wasn't enough demand for it. And a lot of the games ended up being terrible and flops and just failed miserably. So the question is, Will there be another video game craft due, crash due to oversaturation? I mean, didn't I just mention... Oh, so there was three models of the Atari. Now there's three models of the Xbox One. You see what I mean? It seems like we're, a lot of the things are going the same direction. If you look at a lot of games today, you would think that games like Middle Earth Shadow of War, The Evil Within 2, um, you know, these games would be ginormous sellers, right? But they're not. If you actually look, there's been a lot of reports that these games are not selling the way they used to. When you when you used to get a game developed by a well-known game developer like say Cliffy B, right, the guy who behind Gears of War, those franchise anything he would make should turn to gold, right? Well, he made Lawbreakers this year and it flopped miserably. Uh, we're starting to see signs that the industry is on a decline when it comes to big AAA releases not selling anymore. Uh, and I honestly, if you really want my opinion on it, I think it's a number of things. Number one, yes, it is oversaturation. It's that, you know, we used to have, maybe there were one, two consoles competing, and yes, you had PC, but it was different markets. Now it's like everything's this one ginormous gaming market, and when you have so many options, gee, do I buy a PS4, a PS4 Pro, an Xbox One, an Xbox One S, an Xbox One X, a Nintendo Switch, do I get a high-end gaming PC? See what I mean? There's so many choices now that you, it, it dilutes the market. When there were less choices, it was easier to say, oh, the big gaming console is this, and I'm going to go buy this and buy the hot new game. Now, just take a look at the, the, the busy fall gaming season, right? In a, a span of one month, and this is not me exaggerating, I'm going to read this straight off my calendar. In a span of one month, here are the game releases coming out. We had Middle Earth Shadow of War, The Evil Within 2, South Park The Fractured But Whole, Assassin's Creed Origins, Wolfenstein 2, Super Mario Odyssey, Call of Duty World War 2, Sonic Forces, Horizon Zero Dawn, um, The Frozen Wilds, uh, Need for Speed Payback, Star Wars Battlefront 2. By the way, I didn't mention any of the episodic games that released during this time period. Oh, WWE 2K18. See what I mean? All those games in one month, you understand how crazy oversaturation we're getting now? Like, it's out of control. It's to the point where there's no way that... Even if you're the most avid gamer on the planet and you're filthy rich, you still couldn't play all those games in a month. So this is what's happening now. Is we're getting cannibalism of high-profile games. It's not like it used to be. It used to be in the, in the 90s, a high-profile game would release and, you know, that would be the game. The When Resident Evil came out, everyone played Resident Evil. When Metal Gear Solid came out, everyone played Metal Gear Solid. You know what I mean? That was how it was. It was like... We want to, well, not we want to, but there there was a overwhelming amount of hype behind the big release and everyone would play it. It's not like that anymore. Now a game comes out, it's like, well, what do I play today? Do I play Assassin's Creed Origins or do I play Super Mario Odyssey or do I play Wolfenstein 2? I don't even know. All three games got hype behind them and this is what happens. There's oversaturation and the market can't support it. There's not enough people out there buying video games to support this kind of crazy habit uh, of what's going on here. <clears throat> So, that's the bottom line. Um, will we see a, cr a crash, per se, like we saw in the 1980s? I don't know if we'll go that far. Will we see an outright crash? The thing is, in the 1980s, video games were very popular, but they were seen as a fad for nerds, all right? It was in nerds, keep in mind, back then, the word nerd or geek was a negative association. Like, that was an insult. If I called you a nerd or a geek, you oh my god, how dare you? Today... But they, people will proudly say that they're nerds or geeks or they're into geek or nerd culture because now it's become more mainstream. We've got entire subcultures that are based off of it. And now it's gaming, video gaming in general, is the biggest, most profitable franchise or uh, 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 thing in, in entertainment. It's bigger than movies. It's bigger than music. It's bigger than TV. It's actually bigger than everything, okay? It really is. It's the largest thing going on right now is gaming. So would I see a whole market crashing? I don't think so. But I think what's going to end up happening is we're going to see, uh, it's going to be a hell of a lot harder 
for certain games to get noticed, it's going to be harder. Even AAA games, if they don't have ginormous advertisement budgets, all right, it's going to be hard for a game to get noticed. Case in point, like I just mentioned, Evil Within 2, from all reports, I mean, I played it, I loved it, better than the first game, okay, uh, you know, many improvements, giant, you know, really good story. Everything about Evil Within 2 was an improvement over the first game. The first game was a massive seller. Three years later, Evil Within 2 hasn't sold as much as the first game. Uh, but now compare that to Destiny 2. Destiny 2, hugely hyped. Everyone's going to play it. Massive advertisement budget. You saw ads for it for two months straight over the summer till it finally came out. That game sold like crazy. So this is going to be the difference now. Maybe games aren't going to be really about... Mark aren't going to be really about the game anymore. It's going to be more about marketing. And I'll be honest, that's kind of what's going on going on with movies and TV, right? The big movie is the one that you see the ads for for like crazy for three weeks, and then you go, then everyone goes to see it at the movie. It's not necessarily, oh, that's a good movie, and by word of mouth, everyone heard the movie is good, and then we go see it. It's oh, it's the one that I saw the ad for a hundred times on TV. So sadly, I hate to say it, but it seems like that's the kind of direction that we're going. Will we see a market crash of video games? I don't think so. But I think what we're going to see is we're going to see less games from big AAA game developers that are going to become the best seller of the year. We're going to see a lot of things that are different. Like, for example, PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds, right? Virally, the game becomes popular. That game didn't have a lot of advertisement. It was all word of mouth and people playing the crap out of it, right? Games like Minecraft. You're going to see more games like that become popular while the AAA games maybe will not be as popular. We're going to see a shift, I think. Um, whoa, well, shout out to Hank Duma, who tipped me $100 and says, just a small donation to help you in Broketober. Thank you very much, Hank, for, for the tip. I appreciate that. Wow, thank you very much. Hank, a longtime fan and also a patron. I recognize his name from Patreon, so thank you very much, Hank. Thank you, thank you. All right, let's continue on. Second question. Well, this one is a few questions from El Trumpo. He says, let's see, a suggestion I have for a new series. I hope you'll take it seriously. Maybe you could react to negative montages like this is how you don't play or rage montages that show you raging or doing something hilarious during the game to get your retrospective to see if you can get a laugh out of what you did back then. I don't care which channel you do it on. Most popular YouTubers like to do videos where they go back and react to their old videos and it doesn't take much effort. You just find a good montage and watch either live on YouTube or on demand. There's plenty of montage montages. Please, this is just a suggestion. Don't hurt me. Um... <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. I don't know if you've noticed this. Just going to throw this out there. I don't typically adhere to the formula of what every other YouTuber does or what's popular on YouTube. I, over the years, I always do kind of my own thing. Now, there have been some times when, you know, there have been examples where, yes, maybe I adopt something that someone else does or whatever. But for the most part, I, 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 I march to the beat of my own drum. All right. I am fully aware that big YouTubers, typically what they've done, it's a series that almost every big YouTuber does, especially big YouTubers who have been running for years. They go back to their old videos and they watch and they do commentary over them, like live, like re live reaction to my old gameplay style and shit like that. Um, I could easily do this. I could either just go back and get the videos and watch them, you know, myself, or like he suggests, I could go watch a This Is How You Don't Play maybe of one of those. Here's the thing. I'm not going to watch a This Is How You Don't Play and here's why. Because number one, it's just going to propagate negativity because that's what those are about. And number two, because a lot of the this is how you don't plays have a lot of negative shit put into them that has nothing to do with the gameplay. So for example, I don't want to be watching it and commenting and all of a sudden a big negative comment, go die in a fire pops up on the screen and shit like that. Who wants to see that, you know? So no, I'm not going to do that. But I mean, would it make sense to eventually maybe one day do a retrospective where maybe I do pick, let's say fans vote on playthroughs. Uh, you know, it would be a fan voting. What are the, what would be the top 10 best playthroughs for me to go back and watch parts of? And then people could vote, and then whatever wins the vote, maybe I'd go back and I'd take two, three videos out of each playthrough, and I could do that. Yeah, it's a possibility. Um, it's definitely a possibility. However, it's definitely not something I'm committing to. And, I'll be honest, you see how busy I was this year. This year, I changed my style. My style used to be all made videos that's like an offline playthrough, right? And the, the streaming was just fan service. Now, the streaming has become more of the focus for me than anything else. And really, the videos on YouTube are more a fan service. More, I just do that because 
there's people who watch me on YouTube for years and years and years, but my focus is really on the live streams and the interaction, you know, looking at your messages and stuff like that, okay? Um, so, I really have to focus on live streaming all the time, and live streaming gameplay is my forte. Uh, if I were to take time away from doing live streaming of these new games and releases and stuff to do a new series like this, would it catch on, right? Uh, and that would be the thing. I can't dedicate a ton of time and effort to do videos like this if they didn't catch on and people didn't like them. So, I don't know. It's, it's definitely a good idea. Thank you, El Trumpo, for the suggestion. It's something that I'll keep in mind as something maybe for the future. And we'll see if people have interest in it, okay? His next question, what is your favorite bra size? Well, you know, typically I go for like a nice, maybe a an A or a B cup. But lately I've been going for C's, you know. And also I wear the ones like Madonna, those big cones. You know, I like those bras too, the ones that poke your eye out. There you go. Honestly, I think what he's really meaning to ask me is like, am I a boob guy and what what's my favorite size of boob and stuff like that? Um, but that's not what he asked. So my favorite bra size, there you go. And his last question, if a game has multiplayer, would you consider doing multiplayer with those who ask you, who added you on consoles? I think what he's saying is, because I actually know who this guy is, he loves multiplayer gameplay, and over the years he always tries to play with me whatever, whenever there's a multiplayer game. And in particular, he had just recently asked me, could I play a Call of Duty with you? And I said, well, when I first play Call of Duty, I know I'm just going to do some random online play, I'm not teaming up with anyone, but you know, more than likely what's going to happen is if Call of Duty World War II is good, a bunch of my viewers will buy it, and maybe they'll want to do multiplayer sessions with me, and then, then yes, you could get in on it. Um, <clears throat> in addition, okay, what I also do is patron events. So here you go, I'm talking about Patreon again, I know. But what I'm going to actually do, this is going to be the, the, the Patreon goal for December, is if you pledge five bucks or more to my Patreon in December, you'll be able to do a multiplayer event with me in January. Meaning you'll be guaranteed to play multiplayer gameplay with me in the hot new releases. Games like Call of Duty World War II, right? It's one of the biggest ones that everyone's going to want to play. So, <clears throat> there you go. Um... That's kind of how I do it. Usually I just do random multiplayer. If there's a game that I really like to the point where I want to play it at length, then yes, I will do multiplayer lobbies where people can join me. I mean, even with Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, I did a, a lobby where I challenged all my viewers, right? Stuff like that. <clears throat> okay. These next few questions are from Nick. So let's go through Nick's questions. His first question, he says... Given your current financial situation, would bankruptcy be a valid option? This is coming from someone who doesn't understand how bankruptcy works, so it would be nice if you could explain it. Well, I'll be honest with you, Nick. I don't know the ins and outs of bankruptcy. I know how it works. Um, I know that there's qualification. You need to be qualified for bankruptcy in various different ways. <clears throat> One of which is you need to have a certain amount of debt. So I would need to make sure that the amount of debt that I have qualifies to declare bankruptcy. Basically, I think what it is, it's a ratio of how much money you're making versus how much debt you have. And then you can qualify for certain levels of bank or certain types of bankruptcy where the, basically you'll say, yeah, there's no way you'll ever realistically pay off the debt because of your financial situation. And you can declare bankruptcy. And what that does, it, neg it negates certain things. It doesn't negate everything. A lot of people think, oh, it just wipes the slate clean. No, it doesn't actually. Um... I think in, in this case, what would happen is certain revolving debts, like my cr credit cards, would be written off, but other things would not. Installment loans in particular, a lot of the times, do not get written off. You're still responsible for those. <clears throat> Let me put it this way. Bankruptcy, all right, would only happen like as a last resort. For example, I doubt they would even allow me to declare bankruptcy um, right now. Because I own two homes. I own this house in Washington and I have the condo back in Connecticut that I can't get rid of. I'm stuck with it. Um, I think what they would actually require me to do would be I'd have to sell this house first in order to declare bankruptcy. Which means I'd have to move back to the shitty condo in Connecticut. Um, which I don't want to do. So, you know. And in addition, there's other things that I could do if I did get to the point where it was so bad that financially I couldn't pay the bills and make ends meet, what I would probably do, honestly, is call my credit card companies and talk with them and explain the financial situation. Say, look, here's my income. It's declined over the past year. Every year, year after year, I'm making less and less. And, you know, the money spent on these credit cards was to, you know, things years ago to finance the house and keep things afloat and keep the business afloat. And there's no way I could pay it off. So what I would do is negotiate with the credit card company and say, I still want to pay you. I just can't pay you what you want me to pay you on a monthly basis. So... 
what would end up happening is all my credit cards would basically get closed. I'd never be able to use them again, but maybe they would negotiate. So I pay half what the, what the minimum monthly payment actually was. Now that would suck because it would probably take ridiculous amounts of time to pay off if I ever would pay them off. And it, yeah, it would hurt my credit too, but it's still a better option than like losing the house, right? So that's kind of, you know, the situation. Bankruptcy would be like if things insanely got bad. Like, let's say, let's say on top of all my financial troubles already. And then, by the way, there's other stuff going on behind the scenes too that you guys don't know about that I've alluded to and haven't given you the full story on. If everything went horribly wrong at once, like, let's say I had a debilitating disease and I couldn't even work, right? And something else crazy happened and now there was literally no way that I could make money and pay the bill. Then maybe I could declare bankruptcy, but that would be like the last case scenario on top of everything, okay? <clears throat> okay, this next question. He says, would it really be that bad if you moved back to Connecticut? You could move in with your parents and repurpose the condo as a studio. Not how it works. <laughs> First of all, I couldn't move back in with my parents. The house is completely different now. They have their own stuff set up there. And that would be ridiculous to move back in with my parents. It just sounds ugh, 35 years old. Let's move back in with my elderly parents. Would not work. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the condo could not be repurposed as a studio. That's not how it works. Um, there's actually legal ways that you have to do to qualify it. And so basically it wouldn't work. I already checked with uh, an accountant, you know, in the past. And he said, no, that condo in Connecticut could never be repurposed as like a home office or studio. This, where I am now is a home office because this room exclusively is used just for work. I don't do anything else in this room, but for recording and streaming and that's it. <clears throat> Therefore, that's why this is qualified as an office and it's a big tax write-off for me. Um, so now moving back to Connecticut would not work. I wouldn't get the tax write-offs I get now. Um, my quality of my content would go down because I wouldn't be able to do soundproofing like I have now. It would basically be a massive drip dip. I would be going back, you know, three, four years in quality. Um, my internet, right? My internet would, would uh, always used to have issues there. My internet would be down for days and shit because it's the same condo facility with the same shitty internet in the basement, the same fucked up stuff. Uh, the weather, you know, everything. It would be basically the worst case scenario would be if I have to go back to Connecticut because everything would be worse. My back would probably get fucked up again because I have to shovel snow again. It would just be awful. Uh, so I'm really, you know, doing everything I possibly can to stay out of there. All right. <clears throat> all right. Now, Nick's third question. He says, you said you may play player unknowns battlegrounds on PC. If you don't record it, you'll upload it. Uh, you'll, you'll upload via the Twitch archives to YouTube. Would you consider doing this for all of your streams? I don't think most people are bothered that it's 720p over 1080p. Also, it would make uploading easier. Twitch has a feature to automatically split the stream into 15 minute chunks, which would give videos a consistent length. Um, I've already explained why I don't do this. The reason I don't do this is because with YouTube, when I upload videos to YouTube, they're ongoing playthroughs. I title each part. I do all this stuff specific for these videos. <clears throat> if I were to set it up that it just automatically does 15 minute parts and auto uploads to YouTube, number one, I wouldn't be able to title every video. So every video would just be generic. It would be like Evil Within Playthrough Part 37. That's it. No title or nothing. Um, thumbnails, it wouldn't set up the thumbnails properly. That's another thing. And so with big playthroughs, people have actually been designing nice thumbnails for me. So thank you to anyone who has been submitting thumbnails for the, the playthroughs this fall. It's worked really well. People seem to like them. Um, and in general, there's just not a lot of control over it. Like I would, I would rather do it the way I do it. I record and stream and I upload it after the fact. And that way I can control all of it. I can monetize it properly. I can do everything that I need to do. Um, a thumbnails and everything. I could get all that that done properly. Now, in the case of Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, this is an exception. It's not going to be an ongoing narrative playthrough that needs to be numbered properly or whatever. I can just split it up because it's all just going to be raw gameplay of online stuff. That's not a big deal. But for a big, high-profile playthrough of a AAA release, no, I wouldn't want to rely on Twitch to do it right. <clears throat> okay. Let's move on. The next set of questions is from Vera. And she has four questions. First question. Do you think that a website like vid.me would ever become a real competitor to YouTube? Personally, I, I think the only way it's feasible is if the majority of the largest YouTubers actually moved over there. YouTube is owned... I just spilled water all over myself. YouTube is owned by Google. And Google is the largest tech company around. You actually could run YouTube at a loss. Well, they actually run YouTube at a loss. Excuse me. While it's not perfect, it seems the only way to run a website like YouTube... 
and offer the same features as well as good advertisements, something that even Google struggles with sometimes, uh, you seem to have to absolutely bleed money. A small company like vid.me simply doesn't have the revenue from other sources that Google does. Right. Listen, many companies over the years have attempted to compete with YouTube. Um, Vimeo. Vimeo is one of them. Uh, Twitch or uh, uh, Blip.tv. Um, and many more. And the problem is they've all failed. What you need is basically a ridiculous amount of money to maintain a ridiculous amount of servers and have people all there who can maintain constant uploading of videos. <laughs> then you've got copyright issues. Then you've got securing advertisers to run on the videos. It is. It's a giant undertaking. And yes, many, many people don't realize this. YouTube operates at a loss. They don't know how to make money. That YouTube has existed. It's the biggest video sharing website on the internet. And they don't make money. <laughs> I know how stupid that sounds. It's true, though. They don't make money. Um, so, yeah, uh, you're talking about vid.me. You know, a lot of people recently have been bringing up this vid.me, the new, the new thing, the company that's trying to compete with YouTube, okay? Um, and apparently, yes, vid.me has advertisers. They, they, they're in a beta now where you can put ads on your videos and, um, you can make money that way. They also have subscription-based content. They're definitely trying to compete with YouTube, but... Would I jump ship from YouTube to vid.me? There's a certain case. I mean, the first case would be if, yes, if other big YouTubers went over there and said, I've tried it and it works, okay? I've tried it and it's working well. I'm making decent money like I was on YouTube, so you guys should come over here. Number two, if there was a benefit to doing so. Right now, what would the benefit be from leaving my DSP gaming channel, which has been around since 2010, which even though, yes, it's in massive decline, let's face it, because of all the changes and shit that's happened on YouTube, but... I still get thousands of views on my videos. So now, good luck trying to get those people who've been going to DSP Gaming for upwards of 10 years to now, or 10 years, excuse me, 7 years, what I meant to say, to now jump over to another website. It's impossible. And trust me, I know from experience, when I tried to go to blip.tv, it was like pulling teeth trying to get people to go to a new website. The only reason I would ever try to go to, say, another video streaming website would be if... They're, number one, proven to work, like other people have gone over there and they figured out it works. And number two, maybe YouTube for some reason shuts me down. Like, let's say YouTube canceled DSP Gaming. They closed the channel or they blacklisted it. I couldn't get ads on any of my gameplay videos anymore. Then maybe I would say, all right, forget this. I got to try something different. But right now, YouTube is still serving to be a good supplemental source of income. I'll be honest, YouTube's about half my income every month. Right now, the way it's working is I'm getting about half from YouTube and half from Twitch, which is good. Because it used to be like 95% YouTube and 5% Twitch. And this year has been a big turnaround. Eventually what I want it to be is like 95% Twitch and 5% YouTube. But it's going to take a while because some people don't watch my live streams. Some people can't watch my live streams. They say, you know, my internet's not up to snuff. It's not good enough to even watch your live streams. <clears throat> and I get that. I understand that. Um, so already, already I'm getting people who are coming into the stream chat saying, VidMe is ass. Don't go to VidMe. The quality of the website's not as good as YouTube and all that. I don't know. I haven't used it. Right now, like I said, the on-demand watching of my videos really isn't my focus. It's really the live streams have been my focus. So for me, it's not a big deal uh, in regards to everything going on right now with YouTube. I'd, I'd rather, like I said, I just want to make my Twitch grow. Every month I get more followers on Twitch, people contributing to Twitch. That's what I'm looking for, okay? Okay, next question. From Vera. She says, you recently played games like Danganronpa that don't fit the mold of what you've known for playing games like fighter shooters and RPGs. What genres have you never really streamed before that you'd like to try out on Twitch but haven't had the chance because of new releases and other factors? Jeez, I've covered most genres when you think about it. <clears throat> However, um, I mean, I never played, I, well, I've never played a MOBA, right? I really haven't. Turn, turn-based style combat games, uh, it, like, um, League of Legends, Dota 2, those kind of games. I really haven't dabbled in that at all. And that's one of the hugest genres on Twitch are those games, and I've never played them. Um, would I ever want to? I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's a giant learning curve to jump into these games, and they already have these established communities, and I've heard if you try to get into them, it's very toxic. If you're not playing at a high level, people will just fucking rip your, your new asshole. Um... <laughs> So I don't know. That's that's one. I don't know what other what other genres of game haven't I tried? Um, I'm trying to think. Is there really? really for years it was Minecraft, but then I tried that. <clears throat> All right, that's a good a good example. Try hard for life says. What about MMORPGs? 
True. I've never really gotten to an MMORPG in live streams or whatever. The thing is, the time that I tried, like, I tried to do World of Warcraft. Look what happened. I tried to do World of Warcraft, and I just got monstrously trolled. And Warcraft literally had zero protections against it. There was nothing I could do to save myself from that. <clears throat> so, um, I don't know if I could ever even... I don't think MMOs really fit the norm of a game that I could play because I would just get massively trolled. Um, I guess that's the answer. It would be uh, MOBAs and MMOs are the two that I really haven't uh, dabbled with. And I don't think that, MOBA, that uh, MMOs would work. And I think MOBAs, honestly, would have be too much of a learning curve. <clears throat> All right. Next question. What do you think went wrong with the new Life is Strange game, particularly in terms of plot and dialogue? While the original game had some cringy dialogue and a pretty melodramatic plot, the cringe was at a level that I could expect for girls around that age. This one takes the cake. It takes it to a completely new level. It's unrealistically stupid at times. I don't know. You know, you gotta, you gotta see. I, I think what people were saying is it's not exactly the same dev team that worked on the Life is Strange before the storm as the, who worked on the original game. That could be it. It could be a new writing team that stepped in. But I agree, the dialogue for that first episode of Life is Strange was terrible. The dialogue was unrealistic, over the top. And honestly, I think the reason that the original Life is Strange game worked is because you had this element of, oh, time manipulation. And you could go back and change things. And it was the mystery of how the time manipulation came into place. <clears throat> And what kind of crazy things could happen with the time manipulation mechanic, right? People getting shot and stuff. It was pretty crazy. In the, the before the storm, it doesn't exist at all. There's no none of that. There's none of that stuff. Therefore, you've took the element that made the game fun and unique and interesting and made it made that cringeworthy stuff bearable. You removed it from the game. So obviously, that's going to affect the game. And I think that's why this new Life is Strange game isn't nearly as good as the first one because you took that element out that made it interesting and unique. You know what are you what are you going to do? Um, and the final question, a company called Scientific Revenue have started to develop methods so that mobile games will offer players different prices for the same exact microtransaction based on how the player behaves. Is it ethical for games to charge different prices to different people like this? I can't really comment because <clears throat> I don't understand what this means. Like, what criteria are they using to judge different prices? It would it be like a, two people walk into a store. One guy's dressed nicely. He's coming in in a business suit a briefcase, it looks like he's a big money earner, and he wants to buy, I don't know, uh, an iPod, an I, I said an iPod, like an iPhone, and the, the guy's, okay, for you, sir, that's $599, then a guy comes in, you know, tattered clothing, walks in, you know, it looks like he's been through the ringer, looks like he probably doesn't, doesn't make a lot of money, maybe he's a construction worker, maybe he's even like a guard, who knows what he does, some kind of low-income job, comes in not looking good, I, I, same iPhone, and they said, oh, for you, sir, it's $199. Do I agree with that? No, that's ridiculous. Um, everyone, you know, there should be a price point for things that is the same for everyone. I don't know what the, what, what the situation is here. Okay. So, oh, that Anana Bear is actually talking about it. He says, this is one of his questions. I guess Vera wanted to get an answer to she asked as her patron question. He says, they're going to use things like when you get paid, how long you play the game, what kind of phone you use to give different prices for the same microtransaction. So if you're playing the game on a cheap phone, it'll be cheaper to buy the same stuff. If someone's using an iPhone, it's more expensive. I don't agree with that. I think that's stupid. Right now, there's actually discrepancies because people who play games on Droid phones, Android versus uh, iPhones, so like I, I, from, I, from what I'm going to understand... Some games you could buy credits through the Amazon store with Droid, and then you get a discount, and therefore people have been buying stuff on certain mobile games, and they get uh, it's cheaper for them than people who are playing on iPhone. I've seen that before. Um, I don't agree with that. Because here's the thing. Mobile games are pay to win. They just are. And everyone knows it. Mobile games are pay to win. You have to play a ton, pay a ton of money in order to be the best. I play mobile games, and I don't care about pay to win. So guess what? New character comes out. Typically, I'm waiting weeks, months. I'm grinding in a game in order to get the new character because you can earn all that stuff for free. It just takes a lot of time to get it for free versus people who pay up right away can usually get the new content right away. Um, so, yeah, I don't agree with that. I think that everything should be equally priced. Uh, you shouldn't have one person getting a discount on it while other people don't. 
But let's face it. I mean, the whole thing, mobile games is a slippery slope. It's, a lot of people argue it's gambling because when you spend currency in these games, you don't necessarily even know what you're getting. You might have the loot box syndrome, right? Where, oh, buy a random pack of cards for this card game you're playing. You may get a good one and you may get a bunch of shit. It, you know, you don't know what you're getting. The whole thing's a broken system. So, in my opinion, uh, I don't agree. I think that everyone should be paying the same level for, if they're getting the same items. That's just my, my opinion. And shout out to Super Bat Cat, who just subscribed to the channel for the eighth month in a row. Thank you for the resub, Super Bat Cat. All right, so that's it for part one of Ask the King, folks. When we come back, I've got two quick questions from more patrons, and then we're going to get into the, the open forum questions. All right, so I'm going to take a break. If you're watching here live on stream, stick around, maybe five, ten minutes, and I'll be back with part two. If you're watching this on YouTube, it's going to be a separate video altogether. Okay, everybody? Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. And I will see you for part two of Ask the King right around the corner. Thanks for watching, everyone, and I'll be right back.